Hello everyone, today I'm going to show you how you can classify the pharmaceutics of any drug by answering two questions. Can it easily cross a cell membrane? And does it dissolve in a glass of water? If you've ever wondered why some drugs can only be given as tablets or IV, or why propofol is white, this video might be useful. My last video was about pharmacokinetics, primarily distribution. We'll start by looking at the absorption process. Think about what happens when you swallow a tablet. The first thing that typically happens is the tablet will start to break apart and some of the drug will dissolve into the surrounding water depending on its solubility. These fine pieces will make their way into the small intestine. and then break apart further to the point that the drug molecules can diffuse across the intestinal epithelium and into the hepatic portal blood system. The main properties that determine how a drug will be absorbed are its initial ability to dissolve in gastrointestinal fluid, and then even more importantly, its ability to permeate this epithelial cell barrier. In case anyone doesn't know where the video's title came from, this is a so-called political compass. It's a two-axis political spectrum that has gained a lot of popularity online. In addition to the well-known left-right economic axis, it adds an authoritarian slash libertarian uh, axis vertically, and in doing so creates four quadrants. This gives one more degree of nuance, so you could differentiate, for example, the uh, far left authoritarian communism of Stalin or Mao from much cooler decentralized anarchist movements. The authoritarian right quadrant includes fascists and fascist adjacent figures like Pinochet. Finally, the libertarian right are sort of like anarchists without the altruism. This is simplistic, but it's relatively intuitive. And if you put a political philosophy in one of the boxes, it says something descriptive about it. If you're not into politics, we could use psychology. These are Isenck's original two dimensions of human personality. They remain as two out of five factors in a widely used modern theory of personality. Again, you can generate four quadrants that gives us four personality archetypes that date back to ancient humoral theory. Even if the traits have some validity, the big problem with a model like this is that humans typically follow a roughly normal distribution and most sit near the middle. The dividing line between introvert and extrovert, for example, is arbitrary and does not create distinct groups. If you're a moderately anxious person who's moderately extroverted, you could fall into any of the four categories depending on your mood when you took the questionnaire. This is taken to a ridiculous extreme with the pseudoscientific Myers-Briggs personality model that uses four axes rather than two to create 16 arbitrary groups with all of the same problems, but significantly amplified. With these caveats in mind, let's look at the pharmaceutic four quadrant model. In this case, the axes are water solubility and membrane permeability. It's not something I made up. It's known as the biopharmaceutics classification system or BCS. Instead of naming the different quadrants, they have numbers known as BCS class one to four the system was designed to classify drugs based on the major determining factors for enteral absorption. It has particular utility in comparison to the personality axes because the cutoffs for the different axes are clinically meaningful and the resulting groups can be optimized using different strategies. While it's designed for use by the pharmaceutical industry and regulators, I made this video because I found the system to be a useful conceptual tool. Knowing which group a drug is in can be shorthand for many of its chemical and pharmacological properties. You can often just look up the class, but if you needed or wanted to, you could also work it out yourself. I'll mention here that the system was primarily designed for use with enteric drugs. I'm going to extrapolate in some cases to drugs administered via other routes. In hospitals, particularly ICU, a lot of medications are not given as tablets. Let's look at the two axes, starting with permeability. A drug's permeability is considered high if the fraction of the drug absorbed by the gut is greater than 85%. This would be equivalent to its bioavailability if we excluded any forms of pre-systemic metabolism, such as first-pass hepatic metabolism. 
intestinal permeability is heavily influenced by a drug's affinity for lipids, as this is needed to cross the plasma membrane. It's also correlated, although not perfectly, with permeability through other membranes such as the blood-brain barrier. The gold standard methods for measuring permeability are going to be in vivo studies in humans. For example, after an enteral dose, the urine could be measured for unchanged drug and metabolites that indicate the drug entered and was then eliminated from the systemic circulation. Another method is a bio bioavailability study where the plasma's area under the curve is compared with intravenous administration. Due to possible GI elimination in the former, and more significantly, first-pass metabolism in the latter, both methods would still only give the minimum fraction absorbed. There are also animal and in vitro methods. The simplest measure is one that you may have heard of called the octanol water partition coefficient. It's simply the ratio of the concentrations of drug when added to the two liquids in contact with each other, representing the relative solubility for each. It's often presented as the base 10 logarithm or log p. If log p is greater than zero, it prefers the non-polar octanol. If less than zero, it prefers the polar water. You might notice an issue here, which is that it also depends on water solubility. This means that it doesn't only indicate permeability, and it should really be a skewed axis across our diagram with relatively very water soluble on one end and relatively very lipid soluble on the other. To use examples from my last video, the log P value for fentanyl is about 4 and for propofol is 3.8, meaning both prefer the lipophilic environment by around 4 orders of magnitude. There are also more sophisticated assays that better represent intestinal permeability, the main one being a uh, CaCO2 assay named after a colon cancer cell line. The resulting permeability coefficient is speed is in speed in centimeters per second. Again, this is often presented as a log value. An example cut off for high permeability might be log value greater than minus five, which would mean 10 to the minus five centimeters per second. The log values for fentanyl and propofol are both around minus 4.8 which would make them both high permeability using the cutoff of minus five because of the negative numbers. This is also true in vivo, but their high pre-systemic metabolism limits gastrointestinal bioavailability. Now for water solubility. Interestingly, this doesn't just depend on the quantity of substance that can dissolve in water. It also depends on the relative potency of the drug. A drug is described as having high water solubility if the so-called dose number is less than one. The dose number is simply the maximum dose form, for example, the highest strength tablet, divided by the amount of drug that would dissolve in a 250 ml glass of water under relatively physiological pH and temperature. The dose number is the number of glasses of water you would need to dissolve that maximum dose form. So you want that number to be less than one. Neither of our example drugs come in the form of traditional tablets, so I'm going to have to get slightly creative if I'm going to assign them to drug groups. Let's start with fentanyl, which has a water solubility of about 200 milligrams per liter. While not the most common delivery system, fentanyl can be given as a sublingual lozenge. The maximum dose strength is a massive 800 micrograms. If we divide that dose by the amount that you can dissolve in a quarter liter of water, we get 0.016 as the dose number, much less than one. If you take the inverse, this means that you can dissolve at least 62 maximal doses of fentanyl in one glass of water. Despite not being especially water soluble, the extreme potency of fentanyl means it's considered high solubility. And with its high permeability, this puts it in the coveted BCS class one. 
Propofol has a solubility of about 125 milligrams per litre, which is again very similar to fentanyl. Propofol doesn't come in any form of tablets, so I chose 200 milligrams as this represents one standard ampule size and is about the most I can imagine giving at once. This is where things diverge from fentanyl because due to the much larger dose, the dose number is 6.5, meaning it would take 6.5 glasses of water or over 1.6 litres of water to dissolve that dose of propofol. This puts propofol firmly in class two for high permeability but low solubility. So what do the BCS classes tell us about a drug's likely behavior? As we have class one drugs, for example, most opioids, benzodiazepines and beta blockers. When taken enterally, the tablet can be expected to easily dissolve and then for the dissolved molecules to rapidly permeate through the intestinal wall. Unless it's destroyed by the gut or liver before reaching the systemic circulation, it can be expected to have good oral bioavailability with a simple solid formulation. Class II drugs such as most NSAIDs and anticonvulsants are easily absorbed, but the dissolution is the rate limiting process as the drug is relatively insoluble. Absorption can be enhanced by dispersing fine particles of drug in a more hydrophilic carrier substance to minimize dissolution time. Class is still second best option for enteral administration. Class three and four drugs by definition have permeability that limits absorption and therefore maximum bioavailability to less than 85%. Class three can dissolve easily, but permeation will determine whether they can be effectively absorbed. Examples include metformin and most peptide based drugs. They are excellent candidates for IV administration along with class one. Class four drugs are neither high solubility or high permeability, which means that they have the most potential difficulty being absorbed. They are relatively few of these drugs in use as they are not particularly well suited to any route, making them less likely to be developed. Examples in use uh, include frizamide, mannitol and amphotericin. Before we look at more class examples, I thought it would be fun to line up various critical care adjacent drugs along the much cruder log P axis. It's clearly a mess and doesn't tell us much other than the relative preference for each solvent. Let's see how they go instead on the BCS axes. I've had to use some nonlinear scaling for the permeability axis to keep the 85% cutoff in the center for our quadrants and so that the more populous classes one and two have more room. 85% is the high permeability cutoff for BCS, but there are other ranges designated. Between 50 and 85% is considered moderate, below 50 is considered low, with a distinct category for zero permeability. One of the first things I noticed looking at these examples is that almost every drug that primarily works on the central nervous system is in either group one or two. This is because it's generally easier to cross the intestinal mucosa than the blood-brain barrier. If we look specifically at opioids, almost all of them are in group one. This is because they are relatively lipophilic with a log P greater than zero, but they are also potent enough that a therapeutic dose can be dissolved in water relatively easily. The antagonist naloxone is also in group one as it's very potent and needs to have high permeability to cross the blood-brain barrier as a reversal agent. These two traits also allow it to be given intranasally. The least lipophilic opioid agonist, at least the analgesic ones from these examples, is interestingly morphine, with a log P of only 0.65 compared with methadone, buprenorphine and fentanyl, which have log P values around 4. Morphine is just under 90% absorbed by the gut, but first pass metabolism knocks its bioavailability down to around 30%. This is responsible for some of its pharmacokinetic properties, such as its relatively slow onset as it enters the CNS, as well as its tendency to hang around once it gets there. If it was slightly less lipophilic, it would be in class three. There are two opioid analogs that are firmly in class three, and those are both used for their effect on the gut, not the nervous system. Low pyramide is just an opioid agonist that doesn't significantly cross the blood-brain barrier so it just causes constipation without the high. 
Enterprising opioid abusers will sometimes take very large doses of loperamide or even combine it with a CYP3A4 inhibitor to prevent breakdown or a P-glycoprotein inhibitor to enhance permeability, in which case it does cause more typical opioid CNS effects. Unfortunately, this is also associated with deadly cardiac toxicity in the form of QT prolongation. Also in class 3 is the opioid antagonist methylnaltrexone, which can be thought of as the opposite of loperamide. It's extremely effective for the relief of opioid-induced constipation, for example in palliative care. As as a formal charge and zero membrane permeability, it needs to be administered by subcutaneous injection. On the topic of painkillers, most NSAIDs are in group 2, which is fine as most of them are used as tablets. An exception is the class 1 drug Ketorolac, which is far more water-soluble, allowing it to be given as an IV or IM injection. Paracetamol or acetaminophen is also in class 1. General anaesthetic agents obviously fall into classes 1 and 2 due to the need for CNS permeability. Like many class 2 drugs, propofol is notoriously difficult to administer intravenously. Pure propofol is a yellow oily substance that can't be injected and as we calculated a 200 milligram dose that we might give on induction or as an hourly infusion would need to be dissolved in 1.6 litres of water just to stay in solution. As this is clearly impractical, propofol is instead dissolved in a 10% lipid emulsion, which allows a roughly 80 fold reduction in volume and gives the IV formulation its characteristic wise appearance. A more common solution when a drug has undesirable pharmaceutic properties is to make a prodrug form which doesn't. Phospropofol is just propofol with a phosphate group attached, making it water soluble and moving it to class one. It's converted to propofol following injection. Most benzodiazepines are class one, allowing them to be given enterally or parenterally. Midazolam is quite short acting with significant first pass metabolism, but can be given buccally, for example. Oxazepam is one exception with a dose number that just nudges it into class two. Here are some more psychotropic agents um, in classes one and two. Lithium is interesting as it's a charged particle, but as it's a very small ion, it still has high permeability. Molecular weight is another important determinant of permeability as we'll see in class three. Most phosphodiesterase inhibitors are in group one apart from tadalafil and therefore can be given intravenously or orally. This is true for theophylline and aminophylline, which can both be given by either route, although aminophylline has relatively better water solubility, so is typically used as the IV formulation. Milrinone is well absorbed orally and was trialed as a treatment for chronic heart failure until it was found to increase all-cause mortality by 28% in an RCT. Calcium channel blockers are split between classes 1 and 2. Nemodipine is the most problematic, as it's used to prevent vasospasm in subarachnoid hemorrhage, but is best suited to enteral administration. It can be given intravenously, but must be undiluted via a central line in a 24% ethanol solution. Most beta blockers are in class one, except atenolol, which is class three. Atenolol is unusual for a beta blocker due to its incomplete GI absorption, minimal plasma protein binding, and renal dependent elimination. Here are some more antiarrhythmic agents. I discussed, discussed atropine's kinetics in my neuromuscular junction video and amiodarone in my previous pharmacokinetics video. Amiodarone is notably one of the most lipophilic drugs and consequently has a very high tissue distribution. Amiodarone for injection is typically combined with benzyl alcohol and polysorbate 80 to enhance solubility. These excipients contribute to side effects such as phlebitis and hypotension on rapid administration. Many PPIs are in class 1, as is metoclopramide. We know metoclopramide crosses the blood-brain barrier as it causes extra pyramidal side effects. Another prokinetic antiemetic agent, domperidone, doesn't manage this. Remember that GI permeability doesn't perfectly match CNS penetration. Unfortunately, domperidone is much less water-soluble, putting it in class 2, 
which is likely why it doesn't have a parenteral formulation. Apart from the benzodiazepines, most anticonvulsant drugs are in class 2, probably related to high lipid solubility. This means that many agents are only available in an enteral form or very cumbersome IV forms, for example, phenytoin. Phosphenytoin uses the same trick as phospropofol to improve solubility, though in this case it doesn't make it all the way to class 1. ARBs are generally class 2, which is fine, which because we don't usually need to give them IV. GTN is another great example of a class 1 agent due to its high permeability. This allows it to be given sublingually and transdermally, as well as intravenously. You can often spot more water-soluble class 3 drugs because they can only be given parenterally. Many catecholamine analogues are class 3, although some of them are class 1. Many antibiotics are also class 3 with some just given parentally and others needing to be modified to more bioavailable forms, such as for acyclovir and some penicillins. Amphotericin is a pharmacological nightmare as it's class four with limited solubility and permeability. And once you manage to administer it, it's highly nephrotoxic, which may lead, uh, led to multiple exotic lipid-based formulations, as well as its relative disuse. Neuromuscular blocking drugs have poor permeability due to their quaternary ammonium groups, which is probably for the best. Peptide-based drugs are going to be in class 3 due to high molecular weight and charges. These are almost always given by injection, although desmopressin can sometimes be given via oral and intranasal routes due to its potency and very wide therapeutic index. Insulin has been investigated for similar routes with less success. The same goes for larger proteins and blood products. An interesting group are drugs that are given enterally, um, but not intended to leave the GI tract. For example, laxatives, antacids, and vancomycin when used for C. difficile infection. Mannitol is in effective in neurosurgery because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier and functions as an osmotic laxative when given enterally. Furosemide is one of the most common class 4 drugs still in use. Its solubility and permeability put it in the not great, not terrible category, and likewise with Ticagrelor. If you saw my thiamine video, you'd know it has lousy oral bioavailability and needs to be given in high doses to enter the CNS quickly. Finally, metformin is like atenolol in the sense that it has moderate enteral absorption and exclusive renal clearance. To summarize, if it acts on the central nervous system, it's probably class 1 or 2. If it can only be given orally, it's BCS2. If it can only be given IV, it's probably BCS3. If it can be given IV intranasally and transdermally, it's probably class 1 due to permeability and potency. Some class 1 and 2 drugs like fentanyl, buprenorphine, GTN and propofol have low enteric bioavailability due to pre-systemic metabolism. Drugs need to have reasonable permeability to be hepatic, hepatically eliminated and reasonable solubility to be renally eliminated. There's actually a related system called the Biopharmaceutical Drug Disposition Classification System or BDDCS that's more focused on elimination and involves transporter effects, but I don't find it as intuitive or conceptually useful as the BCS. I'm just going to quickly show you this one graph to demonstrate that class 2 and class 4 drugs tend to be highly protein bound due to their poor water solubility, while for class 1 and 2 it's a lot more variable. Now for some books and references. As always, check out Deranged Physiology. If you want more information on pharmaceutics than any doctor could need, check out Alton's Pharmaceutics, which was a major reference for this. I've also mentioned Peck and Harris before. I used a few drug handbooks this time, including the Renal Drug Handbook and these two from the Society of Hospital Pharmacists of Australia, which are ubiquitous in Australian hospitals. 
Most of the quantitative values I used in the big chart I have previously compiled from a ton of online resources, including PubChem, ChemSpider, DrugBank, and numerous journal articles. Some drugs have ambiguous classifications, particularly with the different permeability estimates. I tried to pick examples where there was good agreement between various sources for classification, as well as with my numbers. The protein binding figures were mostly from the Renal Drug Handbook. Thanks for watching. I hope you found it interesting. It's not a topic I've seen discussed much in medical circles. If you did, please like or comment or share it with others. If you want more, check out the other videos in my basic science playlist and subscribe to be notified of future releases. I try to base topics on the CICM primary exam syllabus, but if there's something that you'd like to see me cover, leave a comment and I'll keep it in mind. Okay, bye for now.